Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. We are neck deep now in the season for living history battle interpretations of the Seminole Wars. In the last weekend of February, the Battle of Okeechobee takes center stage on the calendar. Fought on Christmas Day, 1837, that is December 25th, organizers for this event wisely chose to hold it annually on a later date. This clash of arms is arguably the biggest battle of the Second Seminole War. It made a hero of its commander, Colonel, later General, Zachary Taylor, the Army, the government, and the American people, goaded by newspapers, viewed it as a great victory over the Seminoles. Others, however, viewed it as a wash since the Seminoles did successfully evacuate both their families and themselves before escaping into the Everglades to fight another day. We will examine this battle itself in another episode. In this episode, however, we are joined by Dowling Watford, the mayor of the city of Okeechobee. He details what the Battlefield Park is offering visitors for this commemorative event. A lifelong city resident and fifth generation Floridian, Dowling knows his town. A soldier reenactor and member of both the Okeechobee Historical Society and the Okeechobee Battlefield Friends, he knows his battlefield and its park and for our purposes, this event. Dowling Watford, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Okay. Dowling, tell us what's going on the last weekend in February. We're having a reenactment of the Battle of Okeechobee. Our reenactment is February 26 and 27, 2022. It's at the Okeechobee Battlefield Historic State Park, which is a part of the original battlefield. And we have a reenactment at 2 p.m. each day and, of course, other activities going on throughout the day. We have an alligator demonstration. We have period music from Ricky Pittman, who comes from Texas to join us. We normally have a Seminole artist, Rita Youngman, who will sing some of her original songs from the Seminole standpoint. And we have period settlers. We have modern vendors, a good food vendor, and just other activities going on throughout the day. All right, Dowling. Now, this is a battle that happened on Christmas Day in 1837, and yet you're doing this reenactment commemoration at the end of February. What's the story? Right. The original battle was Christmas Day, 1837, and it's kind of hard to kind of get reenactors and other volunteers on Christmas Day. So we had to schedule it around other events uh, that are going on, not only in Okeechobee, other reenactment events and other Seminole events. The Seminole Tribe is one of our great partners, and so we have to schedule around events that the tribe is having also. Over a period of time, we settled on the last weekend of February, and that has seemed to work for us. And, of course, once you get a date, it's best to stick with that same date so everyone knows that you're going to be the last weekend in February. So that's the big reason we have it in February, just scheduling around other events. Christmas Day is just not a good day to have an event. Could you do it some other time? We could do it at any time, but the reenacting season normally goes from October through about April. And we have to schedule around, as I said, other events, Civil War events, Seminole War events. The weather gets iffy the later you go with rain and so forth. So uh, that date has worked for us. It works good for other local events that are going on around Okeechobee so we can get volunteers, public to attend. So the last weekend in February has just uh, turned out to be a good weekend for us. Okay, so we're going to commemorate this battle. What was this battle? The Battle of Okeechobee was during the Second Seminole War. As your listeners all know, there were three Seminole Wars, and the main objective was to get the Seminoles to move to Indian Territory or out west, and we commemorate that event that happened. It was a huge battle in Okeechobee. In fact, it was the 
probably the largest battle of the Seminole Wars, and particularly the Second Seminole War, Christmas Day, 1837. Zachary Taylor was the federal commander. Colonel Richard Gentry was commander of the Missouri Volunteers, and it was a very large battle. Of course, Colonel Taylor declared it a great victory for the federal forces, and that, of course, is one of the controversies and is up for debate. But it was just a huge battle in the Second Seminole War, the probably the largest and costliest battle of the Second Seminole War. Determining the victor in the battle is something historians find a little complicated. But for listeners, they want to know who won. Most historians say it was really more of a draw. It wasn't really a federal victory. However, it had significant impacts on both sides. On the federal side, it gave Zachary Taylor uh, the notoriety of being a great general and colonel at the time. He was promoted to brevet general or promoted to general after the battle. He got the title rough and ready, and he used that in his presidential election and Historians say that it probably, the notoriety of him being a great victor in the Battle of Okeechobee propelled him to the presidency. On the Seminole side, it was somewhat of a loss for them. It was probably the last big battle that the Seminole warriors were able to wage against the federal forces. They split up after the Battle of Okeechobee. Some went south across the lake. They had canoes pre-positioned on the lake. Some went south to the Everglades. Others went over to the coast to Loxahatchee. And in fact, there were two battles at Loxahatchee after the Battle of Okeechobee. So it split their force. They lost quite a few resources at the Battle of Okeechobee, some cattle, some horses, some of their other implements. So it was a decisive point for them, too, in that it probably led to them not being able to mount a large force against the federal forces for the rest of the war. Dowling, give us some highlights or some significant aspects of the battle. The Seminole used more of a guerrilla warfare tactic rather than the Napoleonic tactics that the federal forces used. They were pre-positioned on the lake. They were ready for the federal forces. They had a good position on the high ridge. There's a natural ridge around the lake with cypress trees and oak trees, and so they were very well positioned there. There was a big swamp area that the federal forces had to cross to get to them with sawgrass that we know would cut the uniforms and is very sharp. So they had a great defensive position. They cut paths in the sawgrass to lead the federal troops where they wanted them to go. They were very well positioned on the lake and ready for the federal forces. We've learned through some of our Seminole historians that they cut notches in the trees so they could aim better. They had the women loading for them, and that was a significant fact because then you're firing faster than just a single warrior could fire. When you're opposing a force, you're looking at how much gunfire, how much puffs of smoke you've got coming at you to judge the size of the force you're against. If they're firing faster than a normal warrior would, then federal troops thought they were against a larger force than they actually were. From the Seminole side, it had some significant advantages that position did. They had canoes pre-positioned so they could leave the area. They knew the terrain, so they knew how to get over to Loxahatchee or where they were going to go from there. On the federal side, there were a couple of interesting aspects, one being that Colonel Taylor sent the Missouri Volunteers in first rather than the 4th or the 6th Infantry. He sent the Missouri Volunteers in first, and it's well documented that they got pretty well decimated. In fact, Colonel Gentry was one of the first to be shot and was mortally wounded, died later that night. So there was some controversy over sending them in first. The other controversy is Colonel Gentry had suggested a flanking maneuver rather than a frontal assault. Colonel Taylor accused the Missouri Volunteers of being cowards and they didn't want to face the enemy or fight the enemy. And, of course, that in their manhood. So, of course, they went in on the funnel assault. And then as they lost their officers and NCOs, there was some confusion among the volunteers. And then as Colonel Taylor sent the 6th Infantry in, they had to 
order or tell the volunteers to lay down so they could fire over them so they wouldn't hit them. And Colonel Taylor accused them of breaking and running, and that's been proven that that was not the fact, but he accused them of breaking and running. And there was actually Senate hearings held after the war where the Missouri volunteers testified that they did not break and run, that they did as they were ordered and did try to regroup and try to rejoin the battle. There, there was controversies between the federal forces and the militia as there were in many battles, and Colonel Taylor called it a great victory, and the Seminoles don't feel that way. The soldiers did conduct a rare bayonet charge. Right. The bayonet charge at the Battle of Okeechobee is what ended the battle. It was a fairly long battle, several hours, over a long front, a several-mile front. It was difficult at first, especially getting through the swamp area and the sawgrass, very difficult to walk through, or it was a difficult battle at the beginning. Finally, towards the end, as been documented, bayonet charges were very effective at getting the Seminoles to flee or to leave the battlefield. Finally, they, Colonel Foster, who had fought the Seminoles before, ordered the bayonet charge, and that is what ended the battle. And as in many battles, that was the way to end the battle. The Seminoles couldn't fire fast enough to, to stop that charge. They knew then to flee. So that was the decisive factor in ending the Battle of Okeechobee was the bayonet charge. Where is the battlefield for Okeechobee and how much of it is actually left? The battlefield at Okeechobee, like many other places in Florida, was largely forgotten for a long time. Just as the Seminole Wars were not a popular war and the Civil War overshadowed the Seminole Wars, largely forgotten for a long time. Then a gentleman from Devane, who, an amateur historian, he actually located the battlefield. He and a local a Judge Hancock, who was one of the first settlers in Okeechobee, Billy Bowlegs III was instrumental from you know, stories he had heard in locating the battlefield. The battlefield, as all places in Florida, as growth began in Okeechobee, much of it was developed into housing. The area where the battlefield park was was a cattle ranch. And so that was good that at least that part of the battlefield, about 145 acres, was able to be saved because it was used as a cattle ranch. The rest of the battlefield then lost to development, mostly for mobile homes and one large housing development. What kind of marker was installed to recognize the site of the battle? The Daughters of the American Revolution in 1939 placed a monument along U.S. 441 near the location of the battle and near where the main part of the battle was. They placed that monument in 1939. When we were able to save where the battlefield park is now and have the monument moved to that location, we now have that monument in the battlefield park itself. Most people didn't even know it was there because it was just beside the highway near a local business and nobody ever really saw it. So at least now it's in a position of honor. Colonel Gentry's granddaughter, who was like six years old when the monument was first placed and helped dedicate it, came back for the rededication and members of her family were there. So it was special. The state has been able to save about 145 acres, which is on the very western edge of the battlefield near Taylor Creek. It's a historic state park now. Uh, we're slowly getting some improvements made to the park, restrooms, there's a nice cheeky with picnic tables and we finally are getting an interpretive panel that will be installed, hopefully, by the battle. We've been working on that for five or six years, and the state has finally provided that. So hopefully it will be installed by the time for the battle. Most of the battlefield has been lost to development, but we still have at least a portion of it. Steve Carr did very important rescue archaeology on this site. We're very fortunate that Steve was able to go into where one of the large housing development was being placed, and he was able to go through the muck as they demucked it, put in new fill. He was able to go through that and save quite a few artifacts from the Battle of Okeechobee that he has now given to our battlefield group, and we have on display at the Okeechobee Historical Society Museum. And we hope to display at the battlefield when we at some point get a maybe a small visitor center or museum there. But Steve was able to save many of the artifact musket balls, part of a bayonet and the end of a musket, quite a few other artifact belt buckles and buttons and so forth. Emblem that was on the hat, the end of a bayonet scabbard. So 
we have quite a few artifacts from the battle itself, and we're very fortunate that he was able to save those. If he had not saved those, they would have been lost because the developer was just going to he just pushed it aside and had no interest in it. How much of the battlefield was Steve able to rescue? The location we have for the reenactment of the Battlefield Historic State Park is just a great area to be in. It's Number one, it's part of the original battlefield, and I think most reenactors will tell you it's just really special to be able to have a reenactment on the actual battlefield. It gives you a good idea of what the land was like, what the terrain was like. Although we don't have the sawgrass and the swamps, you can see the it's one of the few places that the natural ridge around the lake is still intact. You can see how it's a little bit higher than the surrounding terrain, the trees and so forth. And you can see how the Seminoles would have been concealed very well in that. It is very close to the city, so it's easy to access. It's just a great area, especially, like I say, you can see how the terrain would have been. And we don't mow the battlefield just down all the way to the ground. We leave a little bit. We want the spectators to be able to see so we do have to mow the majority of it, but we do leave some of it natural so they can see how the terrain would have been at that time. Tell us about the reenactors who come out. The reenactors for the Battle of Okeechobee is an interesting mix because you have to have federal soldiers, you have to have the Missouri Volunteers, and of course Seminoles. So we're very fortunate that many of the federal reenactors that attend Dade Battle and Lock the Hatchy Battle and other battles are interested enough to come to Okeechobee, particularly Archie Marshall and Matt Milnes, who are leaders of the reenactors. So we're very fortunate to have them. Then we're fortunate to have a lot of Civil War reenactors that will portray the Missouri Volunteers. So we're very fortunate that they come and participate with us and act as the Missouri Volunteers. So we're very fortunate for that. And then the Seminole Tribe is one of our great partners. We have some Native Seminoles that participate as reenactors, and then we have the other reenactors that portray Seminoles. So it's not only a good mix of reenactors, but it's a good good mix of the what would have been there. You can see the Missouri Volunteers, the Federal reenactors, and Seminole reenactors. You can see exactly who would have been fighting there and what they would have been wearing and weapons and so forth. It's a very good mix. After the many years since this battle, we have become extremely good partners. Seminoles have become very good partners with us in this effort. They were very instrumental in saving the property. They're one of our big sponsors of the event financially. They support us, like us, through reenactors, and they come to provide Seminole pumpkin bread and Seminole food, and spectators really enjoy that. So the Seminole Tribe has just been a great, great partner for the event. The Seminole Tribe Council really has been very supportive. A lot of people don't understand that it's a very important part of their history also, and so they want to preserve it just as much as we do because it is such an important part of their history and how the tribe has evolved over time. They participate in our honor guard when we present the colors. They fly the Seminole tribal flag, participate in our colors presentation. Some of their officials are there and some speak at the event during the narration. So it's just a great partnership with Okeechobee Battlefield friends and the Seminole tribe, and particularly the Brighton community. The Seminoles have a camp for the reenactment. Visitors can interact with them. It's very nice that visitors can come through the camps. They can come through the Seminole camp, the Federal Army camp. They can talk to the reenactors. Most, most reenactors are, as we call them, living historians. Most of them have a not only a good appreciation, but they understand what happened and the significance of it. So they're glad to share their stories, the history. It's just interesting to see the, the uniforms and weapons and how that was during that time. Most of our spectators, and I found this at most reenactments, of course, they're most interested in the Seminole aspect. Seminole clothing, it's always very colorful. And I really think that most of the spectators appreciate what the Seminoles went through, how unfair the federal government was to the Seminoles. And I think they really have compassion for the Seminole issues. I've often found that almost all reenactments, they actually cheer for the 
Seminoles rather than the federal army. When the Seminoles are successful or particularly a day, they, they actually cheer for the Seminoles. And then when the battle is over and they're invited to come out and speak to the reenactors, 90% of the spectators will go where the Seminoles are gathered rather than where the federal army is. Just, it's really interesting to see. But I think that says a lot about the compassion they have, the understanding they have of the issues and how important it was and how the Seminole were mistreated. They are very grateful that they have survived and grateful for their participation in the event. Dowling, it's not just that you have a civic-minded approach to good community relations. As a reason, you seek good relations among all the people in the community. There's something else. I have a personal stake in the whole issue, being a fifth-generation Floridian and understanding the history of the Seminole Wars and how important they were to our history, being a native Okeechobee resident and understanding the importance of the Battle of Okeechobee. And then I'm very fortunate that I have grandchildren that are Seminole or half Seminole. So I've learned an awful lot about their culture. So I have a much better understanding now than I did in the past about the Seminole culture and the significance of the Seminole War to the Seminole tribe. We're almost out of time, Dowling. What would you like to add? As we participate in this historic event, I would just encourage people to Number one, if at all possible, to attend our event. And I would really encourage people to focus on the history of the Seminole Wars, how important they were to the history of Florida, how important they were to the Seminole tribe. The Seminole tribe is very appreciative of their ancestors that fought, especially those who survived in the Everglades who refused to leave and survived in the Everglades. The Seminole tribe today are descendants of those that fought and stayed here. Uh, it's just amazing to me how much they appreciate those ancestors and revere those ancestors and what they went through. We're very fortunate to have Seminole Tribe Reservation at Brighton, which is close to Okeechobee. It, technically, it's in Glades County, but they consider Okeechobee their home. Their address is Okeechobee Address. Most of their students come to school here in Okeechobee. They do all of their shopping here in Okeechobee, and we have become very close to the Seminole Tribe. The residents of Okeechobee understand and welcome them, so we've become very close partners with the tribe, those residents of at Brighton. As I said, they consider Okeechobee their home. It's an interesting fact that as Andrew Jackson and others of the time, particularly the Washington politicians, felt like the Seminole Indians were inferior that they couldn't coexist with the white. So it's interesting fact that now we coexist, we're friends, we're family, and I think the tribe has proven that they are great cattlemen. They have one of the biggest cattle herds in the state of Florida. They've been very successful in citrus farming. You know, they have sugarcane now. So they've been extremely successful with the hard rock and the casinos. It's just interesting to see how, just to prove how wrong that view that the, quote, whites or the politicians had of the Seminoles, just how wrong that view was. The outcome of all of this, as time has gone on, we can just see how wrong the view that the federal government had with the Seminoles and how beneficial it has been, not only for our community as to be partners with the tribe, but the state has benefited greatly from that partnership with the Seminole tribe. The casinos contribute greatly. They have what they call the compact with the Seminoles to allow the gaming. The state has really benefited financially from that agreement. They give the state millions of dollars for that compact. So it's been very beneficial for our community and for the state of Florida. Darling Watford. Mayor Dowling Watford, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share about the Battle of Okeechobee, and we look forward to seeing everyone February 26th, 27th at the Battle of Okeechobee reenactment. Really appreciate your time and your effort in promoting the Seminole Wars and the history of the Seminole Wars. So thank you very much. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. 
Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.summonawars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Summoner Wars podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation, 2022, all rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast em, provided by kind permission of Reedy Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman, all rights reserved.